This is the first in a series I'm making on some of the evidence for evolution. Episode 1 will be focusing on the work of Dr. Richard Lensky and his long-term circus of evolving bacteria. And of course it will be done in the googly-eyed fashion which is only right and proper. Zing. Dr. Lensky used populations of these microscopic little dudes called Escherichia something coli, commonly abbreviated to E. coli. Thank fuck or my tongue would abandon head in protest. A brief overview of his experiments can be found on Wikipedia. Yes, I know Wikipedia isn't entirely reliable, but it does make a good starting point for learning stuff. At least provides, creationists avert your eyes now lest ye be damned, references. So if you disagree with me, you can all fuck off and read them for yourselves. The experiment starts with some identical E. coli cells in a beaker with a lovely nutritious broth. This broth contains glucose, E. coli's food source. So the E. coli population rapidly multiplies until it reaches a plateau, where only a maximum number can be sustained, i.e. this is the limiting factor for population growth and the source of competition between individuals. 1% of the broth and E. coli mixture is transferred from the first beaker into a second, and so the new E. coli population can reproduce and multiply. 1% of this population is transferred into a third beaker, where again it can multiply, and so on and so forth. They did this for 20 years, totaling around 7,000 progressive beaker populations and about 45,000 generations of E. coli. The expectation here is that the number of successful E. coli cells are more likely to be disproportional in each population and so more likely to be transferred to the next population and continue passing along their successful traits. Remember that, it's important. Now Dr Lensky is one clever little acorn. All of the old populations were frozen to preserve them precisely how they were when the lucky 1% were transferred. They could then be unfrozen and continue living and reproducing normally. This meant that Lensky and his team could resurrect these cells at a later point. So now the team have a chain of around 7,000 sequential populations of E. coli. There were also 11 repeats, making for 12 chains in total. These all started with the same genetically identical E. coli. So we have 12 lineages from the same ancestor cells the experiment started with. There was one difference in the starting 12 populations, the ARA gene. Six lineages started with ARA positive, six with ARA negative. This gene has no effect on survivability, as shown in previous studies, but it acts as a very useful marker, as when plated out, ARA positive E. coli show up white, whereas ARA negative show up red. So we have 12 lineages, where the only starting difference is with their ARA gene. Here's the evolution bit. If we select a recent population from one of the ARA negative lineages and compare it to one of the older frozen populations from an ARA positive lineage, we would expect that the newer E. coli would have a survival advantage over the older, as they'd undergone a longer period of competition and thus natural selection. Lensky's team mixed equal amounts of E. coli from each of these populations in another beaker of nutrient broth and let them compete over that lush glucose goodness. When samples were taken from this mixture and plated out, they found the younger E. coli were now a significant majority of the population, shown by the red marker of the ARA negative E. coli. When it was the younger batch from an ARA positive lineage versus an older ARA negative group, the younger ARA positive E. coli were dominant. This shows that the populations of E. coli became fitter for survival and replication over time under competitive conditions, and there was much rejoicing. This was true of all 12 lineages. The younger generations were better adapted for survival. In all 12 cases, the younger E. coli grew to be larger than previous generations, but in most cases they had gained this largeness trait in different ways genetically, i.e. there are multiple factors that can increase the size and survivability of the cells. When the team studied the DNA genome of ARA positive 1 and ARA negative 1, which appeared to have progressed by the same evolutionary pathway, they found something remarkable. The levels of expression of 59 independent genes had increased. This means at least 59 individual mutations occurred, which caused an increase in the expression of that gene and had a beneficial effect on survival. And this had occurred in precisely the same way in two of the 12 lineages. Now to put on my anti-creationist hat and set phases to get the fuck out of my science lab. Remember how much creationists like to cite probability and bollocks statistics? Bollocks meaning testicles for my transatlantic cousins. What are the chances of 59 individual beneficial mutations occurring? What are the chances of the exact same mutations arising in two separate populations? If you said either really low or fuck me that's a big number, then you are correct. But of course Lensky showed that this did occur, so it's definitely not impossible. This is because, as evolutionary biologists have been trying to tell you nutjobs for bloody ages, it's not random fucking chance, it's natural bloody selection favouring each beneficial mutation, resulting in cumulative beneficial changes. So shove your statistics and probabilities up your rectums and bugger off. Something even more remarkable occurred in the ARA negative 3 lineage. After around the 33,000th generation of E. coli, 
the population of E. coli waved a massive middle finger to their pathetic ancestors and proceeded to go absolutely bananas. Fuck off, Ray. The population skyrocketed to around six times the previous population limits. So what happened? Remember that E. coli used glucose as their nutrition source, but the broth in each beaker also contained citrate, which E. coli cannot normally use if oxygen is present, which it was. What had happened in this population was that E. coli had evolved the ability to use citrate, and so they could exploit the citrate resource in the beakers, and so were far more successful than other individuals without this trait. They dominated the population, and the population limit rose dramatically as E. coli could exploit more nutrients than before. Lenski and his team found that this trait actually required two individual mutations, which is why no other lineage evolved the citrate digestion ability. The first mutation had a neutral effect on survival, but when the second mutation was added, the E. coli gained the trait. The second mutation alone would be useless and have no effect, and it's likely that this second mutation did arise in some other lineage, but without the first primary mutation, didn't affect citrate digestion. So Lenski set one of his students, Zachary Blount, on to study this. The prediction was that in this population's timeline, the primary mutation had arisen, resulting in an increased likelihood of the second mutation occurring and the E. coli being able to digest citrate. This point was found at around generation 20,000. Resurrected E. coli from before this generation displayed no capability of developing the citrate trait whatsoever. But resurrected E. coli after this generation did. Epic win for Team Lenski. So let's summarise this. Lenski and his team showed that natural selection results in increased survivability in a population as beneficial mutations allow individuals an advantage against competition and these individuals are thus more likely to pass the trait to the next generation. Thus, the beneficial traits quickly dominate the population. Sometimes mutations will get very lucky and give a dramatic advantage, as with the citrate, where the E. coli gained an entirely new ability. So to any creationists watching this, hello, how can you explain Lenski's findings? Natural selection leads to beneficial mutations dominating populations. Mutations lead to new DNA information and traits in the population, giving them an advantage in their environment. And that, in a nutshell, is evolution. Mm -hmm.